today we're going to be um, talking with uh, Professor Douglas McKay, um, who is an Associate Professor of Public Policy at the Center for Bioethics at UNC Chapel Hill. We also have our very own Stephanie Moulton, um, from, who's an Associate Professor at the John Glenn College of Public Affairs, and uh, Pamela Salisbury, who's a professor at the College of Public Health. And um, this is gonna be a one hour conversation. Uh, professor McKay is going to start, give us an overarching view of all the ethical issues that he's been dealing with, thinking about um, the ethics of public policy research. Um, that's gonna go for about 15 minutes. And then um, I'm gonna uh, uh, give the floor to Professor Multoon and to Professor Salisbury to just like talk about their own experiences and their own, the own, uh, the ethical challenges that they have faced in the field, thinking about these issues and how um, how they design their own experiments and um, consult on the design of experiments and studies. And then uh, we have some questions that um, we've thought of in advance, but we always want to hear from you, the audience, because you always are thinking about these things um, on the ground and come up with interesting things. So the last 15 minutes will open up for a discussion from uh, Q&A from the audience. So as you are listening, please look down at the Q&A panel, at the, the button at the bottom of your screen. That's where you could start, start typing in questions throughout the program. All right, and so to no further ado, uh, welcome Doug. Great, uh, so thanks so much for the uh, invitation. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, I have some slides uh, to share, so I'm gonna share my screen. And so hopefully that has worked okay. Um, great, so I should preface, uh, I am in a department of public policy, uh, but my training is in uh, philosophy. And so I'm not somebody that actively does social science research, uh, but I do talk a lot to uh, my colleagues who are, who are uh, social scientists and engaging in a lot, a lot of the types of research that, that I'll be talking about. Um, so just to, to, to give an example, you know, I really, I don't think I'm going to give an overview of all of the ethical issues with this type of research. Uh, these are the ones that, you know, I've sort of thought of the ones I kind of want to work on or have worked on or, or, or seem most pressing in public discussions of, of uh, public policy uh, experiments in particular. And so I thought uh, just for, the, for those of you who, who, you know, public policy research might be a little bit new, I thought I would give an example of a prominent experiment uh, that I can ref maybe refer back to a couple of times uh, in my, my comments. So probably you've heard of this, this experiment, the moving to opportunity uh, experiment um, that had to do with the Section 8 uh, housing voucher program in the United States, which offers uh, rental assistance vouchers to uh, low-income households. This is an experiment that uh, took place between 1994 and 1998, and there was around uh, 4,500 households which were randomized to one of three different arms. So one was a traditional housing voucher, which is geographically unrestricted, so you can use it wherever you like in whatever neighborhood you like. Another was an experimental voucher, which was a voucher that was only usable in low poverty neighborhoods and also included um, forms of counseling. And then a control group uh, received no voucher. Um, and what the investigators are really interested in is determining the outcomes when you move families from high poverty neighborhoods to low poverty neighborhoods. So does it improve their social and economic uh, prospects, for example. So the findings uh, I think are really important uh, and have influenced housing policy, have influenced the, the design of, of further experiments. And they found that um, moving to low poverty neighborhoods improved family safety, adults' mental health, physical health, and subjective well being. There was no, unfortunately, significant impacts on the earnings and employment rates of adults and older youth. But 
later on uh, in, in, you know, in 2016, we were able to take a closer look at what had happened to the younger youth in this experiment. And we found that those who, who were 13 or younger at the time of randomization saw really significantly improved earnings, um, college, attendant, college attendance rates, and had a better likelihood of, of, of living in, in low poverty neighborhoods. So why is this type of research important? Um, so one of the reasons that's, that's often given is by using randomization, you can get higher quality, maybe even the highest quality evidence regarding the causal efficacy of an intervention. So in this case, the thought is by randomizing these households to these three different interventions, the household is going to be roughly equivalent in the, in the relevant ways. And so the differences in outcomes over time is just going to be due to the different interventions to which they're subject. So this is, of course, a controversial claim. Uh, and so if you want to uh, think about it some more, Angus Deaton and Nancy Cartwright have a paper published a couple of years ago that really gets into the details of whether randomized controlled trials should have a kind of privileged status. But more generally, just having experiments, if they're going to yield good evidence, is just incredibly important um, for evidence-based policymaking and for realizing the values that we think the government has a duty uh, to realize or is good for society to realize. So, you know, the, thinking of the moving to opportunity experiment, gives us really important evidence about how to boost the income college attendance rates of, of young kids later in life. And so it's incredibly uh, important piece of information. And you can think about doing these types of studies in other domains, education, public health, and so on, to yield information that we can promote people's well-being. So these types of experiments, as you can imagine, uh, raise a number of, of ethical issues. And this is something that I've really been working on as a re researcher the past number of years. And one of the reasons I've been working on it is that there's not a lot of people working on it. Um, so I've found that there isn't really what I would call a literature around the ethics of public policy research, where there's a kind of sustained discussion. Um, there are concepts and principles that people can, can readily to, uh, uh, appeal to. And you know, one way of, of, of thinking about this is by looking um, at clinical research ethics, where we're concerned with the ethical treatment of human subjects in clinical research. And the contrast is just incredibly stark. So um, if you think about clinical research ethics, just in the United States, there's probably hundreds, if not thousands of faculty who are actively working, uh, publishing papers, et cetera, consulting on the ethics of, of clinical research. So just one, one example. Um, so there's this proposal to use um, what are called challenge studies to evaluate a COVID-19 vaccine. And these are very controversial because they involve deliberately exposing subjects to uh, coronavirus in a controlled setting, either to test a, a vaccine candidate or to learn uh, about the path of infection. And just since March, there's probably been, I don't know, 40 papers on the ethics of COVID-19 challenge trials that have been published in peer-reviewed venues, right? Um, so there's just a really vast um, contrast. Okay, so what are the big issues? So um, one, I think, is informed consent. So oftentimes in a lot of these studies, informed consent is not sought from participants, either due to concerns of scientific validity, so maybe worries about selection bias, randomization bias, or feasibility. Um, one commentator very recently uh, in an issue of world development uh, devoted to um, the use of RCTs in, in the field of development economics argued that the lack of informed consent uh, is morally worse, worrisome enough that we should have a moratorium on the use of these studies uh, in, in low-income countries. The broader question here is when is informed consent necessary for ethical research? And in the context of clinical research ethics, it's almost always necessary. Um, but one of the puzzles here, and I've explored this in a, in a paper with my co-author, Avri Chakrabarty, is that there's a really important difference, particularly when research is carried out by, by government agencies, in that whereas 
doctors or physicians or clinical investigators don't have authority over what people put in their bodies, governments do have authority over the policies to which people are subject. So they get to make those decisions, not individuals themselves. And so there's a puzzle there as to whether informed consent is really as necessary in policy research as it is in clinical research. Another question is social value. So social value is well recognized as a criterion in the context of clinical research. And the basic idea is that human subject research is often costly, it's risky. And so to be okay, it needs to be um, sufficiently valuable to society. It needs to generate knowledge that could be useful for improving people's well-being. Some broader questions to think about. One, is this a standard that should apply to policy research? I would say yes, but how do we understand it, right? What's the, what's the right way to understand it uh, in the context of evaluating uh, proposed um, policy research protocols? Um, do we think that, you know, existing policy experiments for the most part satisfy such a principle? And there's a number of challenges to this that have been raised in the literature, challenges about generalizability and external valid validity, challenges about knowledge gaps, also ch challenges just about the whims of political actors, right? In the sense that, you know, some people might think if you're going to do a policy experiment, there needs to be uh, a high likelihood or reasonable likelihood that if it's an intervention is proven to be successful, that it would be implemented. But of course, uh, a lot of times politicians have control over what's get, what gets implemented. And there's a nice example from the Canadian province of Ontario where the Liberal government instituted this pilot project that just got shut down by the new government about two years in, and they didn't even, even finish the study. And so it's a good case of like, was there sort of social value, an expectation of social value, given a real risk that, you know, if the Liberals don't win the next election, they're not going to actually be able to complete the trial. Another big issue that's come up is um, borrowing a term from clinical research ethics, standard of care. So in the clinical research sphere, standard of care is, it just refers to the level of medical care to which patients are entitled or which participants should be guaranteed as a kind of floor or baseline. Um, we don't even have a concept for this, I think, in, in policy in research ethics, but there's a real question here as, what are people entitled to, right? What are citizens entitled to as a kind of floor or, or baseline? A couple of cases where this has come up, I think you could, you could bring this up in the moving to opportunity RCT, right? You might ask, is it okay that the Section 8 housing voucher program is not an entitlement program and so that we are randomly assigning uh, households to receive no voucher while we're randomly assigning others to receive a voucher. Um, it also came up um, uh, recently with an experiment uh, in Nairobi, Kenya, where the intervention was um, uh, basically if people refuse to pay for their water services that they would be, would be shut off. And so a lot of people argued, look, people have a right to, to access to water services. And so that's just not okay to be there as, a, as an intervention that's, that's being studied. Another question um, is around randomization. So if you buy the story that randomization, random assignment is really important for knowledge generation, um, there's another question about, well, when is it fair to use it, right? Randomization is desirable for epi epistemic reasons, the argument goes, but it's also a way of allocating access to an intervention. Um, and so there's a question about whether allocating via a lottery essentially is, is okay or not. Um, I've, in, in work I've done, I've, I've tried to argue for a couple of conditions when I think randomization is okay. One is a case of equipoise where there's genuine uncertainty in the social scientific community about which intervention is actually better. And so it seems okay to say, we're gonna just flip a coin to decide what people are allocated to. Another is where we have a scarce benefit, right? So we, we're talking about this a lot with respect to um, scarce critical care resources in the, in the pandemic. And the thought is where you have people with equally weighty claims to a scarce good, it can be okay to use a lottery, right? And that creates a, a, a possibility for conducting a study. One of the challenges here is the conditions where a lottery is fair might actually be quite limited, 
Um, and so if you go back to the moving to opportunity experiment, you know, someone might argue that, um, look, the way to decide who gets access to a voucher and who gets access to no voucher should really be based on need, right? And some housing authorities in the United States um, don't flip a coin or use first come first serve, but take a look at the nature of the households. How housing insecure are they? How many children do they have? And use that as, that those criteria as relevant for deciding who gets access to um, resources. Uh, so very quickly, uh, uh, two more slides. So um, another final consideration is community engagement. So particularly in RCTs in um, low income countries, there is a lot of concern about whether, you know, institutions like the World Bank are really sort of running roughshod over local governments in pushing RCTs when local governments would rather do something else. There's also a question of whether there's sufficient buy-in from community members, whether they even understand why randomization is being used as opposed to another alloc uh, principle of allocation. So just to sum up, finish up. So I think that um, policy research um, raises a number of ethical challenges. And um, at least as far as, you know, my, my view is that I would really like to see more of a field develop where people are more actively conducting research on uh, the ethics of pol policy research. I think this is probably starting to happen more and more. Um, current initiatives I'm engaged in, um, one is the Oxford Handbook of Research Ethics, which I'm co-editing with Anna Iltis, and we're really trying to have this not be a focused on only clinical research ethics, but also on social science research ethics. And then um, we have this uh, cash transfer project based at UNC and, and coordinates with UNICEF and other organizations. And uh, I've been writing for, the, uh, for their blog there about, about these issues, um, just to sort of uh, ha have more than just sort of peer reviewed articles, which, which probably nobody, nobody reads. So I'll turn it over to uh, so the social scientists on the panel and I'd just love to hear their, their perspectives and, and, and also you know, what I'm missing just as a, as a philosopher approaching these, these issues. Great, <clears throat> thank you. Um, do you want me to go ahead, Dana? <laughs> yeah, well, why don't you go, Stephanie, um, okay. since you are the social, one of the social scientists. I, <laughs> I am is also a philosopher, so. <laughs> Excellent, awesome. Well, thank you. Um, and Doug, that was awesome. I really appreciate your uh, presentation. I think you're raising really important issues that we need to think about carefully as social scientists and policy researchers. And I do think you know, as you know, like the history of public administration and public affairs, ethics are so central to what we do. Um, and I do agree that I think that the kind of policy research, the policy analysis research gets divorced from some of those ethical questions that you're raising that I think are really, really critical. So thank you for raising them. And I'm just going to spend, I've got about five minutes, so I won't be able to go very deep, but um, I just have a few comments. So overview of who I am, I do um, consumer and housing policy research. But I also do research on implementation and management. And so kind of that interplay between um, how we actually carry things out in the real world, along with kind of a policy analysis and evaluation. And I think that's important. Um, one of the things that I'm guessing you may be familiar with of too, but I think it adds another wrinkle to this, is the generalizability of these experiments. So I do, you know, uh, sometimes I use randomized control trials in my work um, and field experiments. And I think you know, a big thing that I've run up into and, and I think is really important for us as policy research to think about is how gen generalizable are these, these kind of these randomized control trials. Um, field experiments you know, have this um, kind of sense that they're more generalizable than a lab experiment because we're working with people in the real world. Uh, but oftentimes we contrive the conditions so much that they really aren't generalizable. And so, and I think that raises ethical issues as well. Um, because we might be saying that this policy is super effective, but it's super effective in this really contrived context where the researcher is controlling everything. Um, and so, you know, and I think there's this balance, you raise this question of like uh, consent and whether or not participants should give consent. And one of the arguments against getting consent is this generalizability issue, right? So the idea is that if we go through this consent process, then the generalizability of our experiment is, you know, going to be compromised. On the other hand, if we don't go through the consent process, as you've said, the ethics of this are really questionable. And so I've been on a few studies, um, one with HUD, for example, where we're evaluating the effectiveness of, of counseling. Um, 
And so the challenge is that often low-income individuals are required to keep to take counseling before they can get a federally insured mortgage. And this is a really burdensome requirement on low-income individuals that could actually create inequities and inequalities. And so from an ethical standpoint and kind of somebody that cares a lot about inequalities, I want to know whether or not this is effective or not. Um, is this really, should we be requiring this policy for individuals? Um, and there's so much self-selection into this. If we don't have something that's kind of approximate to randomization, it's really hard to know if this is effective or if there's some other reason. And I can elaborate on that later. Um, and HUD's approach, they have used the consent um, method. So we, we get consent from everybody before they, they enroll in the, in the study, just like you would with a medical trial for a lot of the issues that you raise. But it does raise lots of questions in about the ethics of this study. So, or I'm not sorry, the, the generalizability of this study. So while on the ethical side, we've, been, we've improved that, we have in some ways the generalizability is, you know, is challenged. So I think there's a, there's a trade-off there. And one thing that I'd love to hear your thoughts on, Doug, and even some of the health researchers on the, on the, on the, on the call, um, you know, something that I've been looking at is this precise framework um, that I see in implementation science. And so if you're not familiar with it, I encourage you to Google it. It's called precise, P-R-E-C-I-S. I actually have a paper that I've drafted on it and I haven't published it yet, but I think we should think about this precise framework in the, in the context of policy studies too. So for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's, it's a pragmatic randomized trial approach. So the idea is that, you know, instead of seeking to do these explanatory trials where we have these perfect ideal experimental conditions, we actually care a lot about the community that we're working in and we care a lot about the setting and the people and we work with that setting to develop the study. And we re really care a lot about generalizability too. And yeah, you're sacrificing some of the kind of causal, causal elements, but it's, it's actually a better, um, you end up with an intervention that actually is gonna be stickier over time and might be better for that community. And there's this precise framework that's often used, I guess, in health studies and in clinical trials from what I've read, um, but it hasn't been applied to policy research. And I, I would like to see that, that happen a bit more. And I think that could help us as policy researchers think more kind of intentionally about some of these elements that we currently, you know, I think a good policy researcher might think about them, but then somebody that just wants to publish an AER doesn't think about them. <laughs> so it's, it's a challenge, it's a trade off. All right, so I'll stop there. I'm happy to engage questions and thoughts later. Thank you. And um, just as a reminder, um, if you have questions that are burning, like please write them down in the Q&A. And Pam, can you also bring your perspective from public health and thinking about the ethical issues of some of these public policy um, studies that you've been part of? Um, and, and thanks for uh, inviting me to be here. So um, a couple of things that I want to say at the beginning. Um, and um, as we think about the policy research question um, is even to take one step up uh, and to think about policy agendas um, and uh, the worry about uh, policy agendas and um, how we justify policy agendas. So um, in here, and maybe this is the sort of philosophical background coming out, Dana, um, you know, the idea is that uh, policy agendas really are about um, uh, a moral justification so because that's always how I've approached sort of policy issues is that it really is about the distribution of scarce resources and how we in um, uh, our uh, groups decide who has access to what resources. And so that's sort of generally how I sort of think about policy and policy agendas. And, so, so one great example right now that probably most people are familiar with um, is the policy agenda of somebody like the Poor People's Campaign um, of Reverend Barber and his uh, 14 items that he has put out for um, a policy agenda. Those aren't the same kind of policy work that I know we're gonna get uh, down in the weeds here a little bit about, but I just wanna make sure as we think about um, um, the ethics policy that first and foremost, what policies we decide to study <laughs> um, fundamentally has to be justified by uh, probably a moral um, platform and, and what it is we want to accomplish in society, right? And, and if we don't do that first, then we're, we're um, the how-to, which is how I see the RCTs or the cluster, cluster of trials or whatever, how we do it becomes a question in, in, at this level. <clears throat> so that's sort of one thing. Um, and 
Um, and so I'm sort of knee deep in a couple uh, really big trials right now that have to do uh, with community engagement. And so I'm gonna sort of pivot and talk um, around community engagement a little bit. Um, and I worry a lot that we try to use the individual uh, consent and the individual approach to human subjects and the individual approach to ethics in, um, in the sort of larger community engagement. I think a lot of policy work is really community engagement is sort of how I, I would see it through my lens, right? And so um, I think of consent as being very layered. So at, at, at what layer do we need to arrive at consent? And so, um, you know, if we're gonna randomize communities, which often policy does, um, should those communities have a say in that? Um, and how do we uh, figure out um, what that consent's gonna look like and who's gonna offer that? I think just because it's hard to figure that out doesn't give us a pass. And, and too often, I think that's what happens. We say, it's just too hard. We don't know who we're supposed to go to in the community. Um, so therefore, we're not going to do it. And you know, the IRB is not going to require us to have a consent. Um, so I think, I think there is um, a, a sort of ethical responsibility to go into that community and, and discuss what it is we think we're going to do. And, and, you know, there is a literature on this, I'm sure Doug, you know, um, around um, community engagement. And there's been um, the work that's, that's come out of Ottawa, which with the statement around um, uh, cluster trials and things. So, um, so community engagement, but then when you delve down and you get individuals involved in the work, like Stephanie pointed out, you end up having to get individual consent, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't uh, relieve us of a duty to be sure that we're respectful of uh, at the individual level. So, um, and the last thing I would just say in terms of the, the discussion around generalizability, which is always the, is one of the big issues, right? Um, and for individuals who do a lot of community engagement work, one community, you see one community, right? Um, and understanding the context becomes very important and, and understanding um, you can't control for those, even if you randomize, you, you never are quite sure what you're walking into in, in a community. So um, I was, um, uh, so I, the community engagement, the one last thing I would say, um, it's also very important and I really was happy to see that you had it on your slide was the sort of broader question around randomization and distributive justice. And that is the equipoise question. So. Um, we really have to be sure that we don't have an answer, right? That, that, there, that this is a real question that needs answered. And I think we have to engage with the community to find that out um, and figure out the right way to do it. So that's sort of my sort of uh, perspective uh, at this point. I think we're ready uh, for Dana to ask us questions or comments back from Stephanie and Doug. Yeah, thank you. Um, so before we move on to some questions, Doug or Stephanie, do you have any like comments or responses to some of the other issues that um, others have brought up? As you're thinking about this, one thing that I think is interesting is sometimes we want to pit generalizability, like research integrity or scientific value of the research with the ethical questions about informed consent. And I think one thing that this discussion is already bringing up is the way in which if we care about the social value of the research, like the generalizability is going to be a really important component of it, right? So the sort of scientific integrity of the research, the fact that the question is actually, it's the right question and it can be answered by the study um, is a very important, it's a very important ethical um, uh, requirement for the study to, to, for us to ask participants to be part of the study and for us to put our resources in it. So um, yeah, so okay. So any other thoughts before we go? Okay, so I'm going to give you some uh, pre thought out questions, but there's already some great questions that are being pulled in the Q&A. So I want to have 10 minutes of our questions and then open it up for a discussion um, from the audience. So the first is, and we've already heard, you know, there's observational studies, the randomized control trials, implementation science, 
pragmatic trials. There's all these different kinds of ways in which we could design this research experiment. And they're not always mutually exclusive, but you know, there's like, so one question, both from a philosophical perspective, but also from a sort of a practical perspective, how should researchers be thinking about their research design from the outset? Should, how should the ethical questions come up? So maybe some, some studies, like maybe randomized controlled trials, they are more risky in certain ways, or they you know, treat different participants in this way that raises certain questions. Maybe that should be you know, the, the kind of design of last resort or something if the actual research question can be answered in other ways, or maybe not, right? So either philosophically or as a practitioner, how do you go about making those decisions and when, when do the ethical aspects enter into your consideration of research design? I, if you if you want, I can give a quick answer. <laughs> um, so I think those are first and foremost. I think these ethical questions have to be first. And I want to say, you know, I think in policy research, there's ethical issues with all types of studies. So every study design is going to have an ethical issue. And I want to come back to this this housing counseling requirement I mentioned. Um, so so there was a requirement for a while that if you had a federally insured mortgage, you needed to get housing counseling, and you needed to go through eight hours of housing counseling. It's this really onerous process. And they came to that conclusion because of observational studies. So it wasn't an RCT, but they came to that conclusion because of observational studies that showed that people that went through these housing counseling programs that were somewhat arduous ended up with, with less default, lower mortgage default. So let's require it. The problem is that this has a, a disproportionate impact. And it was, it was only required of people that had low incomes, by the way. And so this disproportionate impact on low-income individuals often drove them away from federally insured, insured mortgages into subprime products because of this policy requirement. So an observational study that just said, guess what? There's this relationship between getting homeownership counseling and reduced default. Now we should require homeownership counseling because of it was not sufficient. And so I think, you know, on one hand, I would say that, that that's an ethical problem. We're creating distributive justice issues there, putting the burden we're actually creating a problem that we're requiring low-income people to go to this, this onerous burdensome requirement. We aren't requiring high-income people to do it. And we're finding this outcome that is supposedly good. Um, and, and so I actually think in that situation, we needed a randomized control trial because we need to understand, is it really the homeownership counseling that's causing a better outcome? Or is it something about this selection process that the people that are riskier are selecting into these high-risk mortgages? So you're left with this pool of less risky people that don't default that's actually a problem. And so, you know, what we were finding is that, you know, you actually may not need an eight hour requirement. It may be simply making sure people have the resources and support on the back end after they close on their home. And so, you know, I think there it's like these ethical questions, I guess my, my big high level thing would be that these ethical questions exist in all types of policy research, observational studies, qualitative interviews, as well as, as RCTs. And I think they're really critical to think of like at the outset. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Um, and you know, but, uh, Aaron, I'll just say a couple of things. So uh, Aaron Carroll, writing for the New York Times, has this great piece where he looks at this study of this wellness program that was offered to university employees. And you're able to sort of like, uh, they did an RCT, but you can sort of look at how you would study it if it was an observational uh, uh, research. And you get different answers, right? On the observational research, it looks like it's doing great stuff. On the RCT, it's not doing anything in terms of the things that you're... So maybe something to, just to, to link to the, the, the notes. And the other thing, I think that um, uh, there's a, this is really nice uh, uh, sort of empirical ethics piece. Um, I think Michelle Meyer is, is, is the author um, that finds that people really don't like randomization. Um, even where equipoise is satisfied, it just really rubs them the wrong way. But even if you're doing like a kind of pilot study with like an artificial control or something, you're still subjecting a group of people to a new intervention. And so it's not clear like you avoid um, any of the ethical issues that we, we've kind of um, talked about, right? And you're still allocating to some people, not others. And so these fairness concerns arise as well. And so I think it's you know good to not think of um, there's sort of, you know, um, that RCTs are uniquely evil or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Sam, do you want to answer? Do you want any other, anything else? No, 
I mean, I, 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 um, I, I think that just, uh, you know, highlights the importance of having a clear reason for why you're going to, you're going to um, go down this road. Um, and it's always the case that the uh, research should be designed to answer the question. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you, you choose the design that best is going to get you your answer. Um, um, and those two examples are great examples of where it's, it seems to be really justified to put people through the, through the paces. Um, I would just say again on, um, you know, this issue of uh, consent and, and randomizing, I don't think communities like to be randomized either. <laughs> so it's not just individuals. <laughs> um, and it's, it's hard um, um, to be able to figure out who and how do you get consent from a community to be randomized. So um, in one of our, one of the large studies that I'm involved in is that was a lot of the discussion that we had, you know, we were randomizing counties. And how do you get who's the right person to first understand that they're going to that county is going to be randomized and that they can give permission for that randomization? Um, it's um, I would have to say that it is murky. <laughs> um, but again, I would say just because it's hard, you don't at least attempt to, to do it. And I don't think the the procedures and policies around IRBs um, have got this figured out yet. So it's to your point, early point, Doug, in terms of we really need a lot of work to figure this out. And I think there's gonna be more and more of that kind of work and uh, where you have groups that get randomized and how do you get um, a reasonable consent from those groups, so. So this is, um, we've already talked about sort of community engagement and informed consent a little bit. So I'm gonna ask one final question for the preset questions. And then there's some really great questions already um, being asked by the audience. So we'll get to those shortly. So, um, so I mean, sometimes, so this is a question about social value and the sort of underlying justice motivations for thinking about what research questions to ask. Um, and so sometimes policy studies are about mitigating costs about of proven policies, right, that have the evidence to back them, but for either political reasons or for economic financial reasons, they're not feasible. Um, and so um, how should we think about the ethics of such trials, right, that sort of we know what the sort of gold standard is and the, the policy implementations that we're going to be studying are things that don't are either cheaper than the uh, than the gold standard, or um, are at least like maybe more politi politically feasible than the gold standard. Um, so, how should we think about those the ethics of that kind of research? Have you come across those kinds of studies um, in your own work, and how did you negotiate those questions? I can go first unless anyone else wants to jump in. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I've thought a, a fair amount about this type, type of topic and it, it comes up a lot, I think, you know, in international mm -hmm. research and just other areas where there's, there's real resource constraints. Um, and for me at least, and this is only one, one, one part of it, is that I, I think it really matters um, who's doing the study. Uh, I think that matters morally. So in, in the sense that um, if you have a, a, you know, a government body that has the ability to implement the gold standard policy and it's feasible, then I think it's very hard to argue that it's, it's okay to run a, run a pilot project or something that's, that's evaluating a less effective and cheaper intervention. If by contrast, there's sort of a divergence of responsibility where the folks who are proposing the research are not responsible uh, for the failure to, to, to implement and are sort of offering a study that can, can um, evaluate intervention that is not gonna be as good as the, the gold-plated policy, but could be implemented and could improve the well-being of the, 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 the participants involved, then I think it, it, it looks a lot better, right? Um, it's, it's more sort of researchers stepping in and trying to help with a situation that they are not responsible responsible for. 
would just add, I think, you know, there's a lot of push. I think Doug mentioned this, but from funders right now um, that, you know, in order to get funded, you need to do an RCT. And, and this is pressure that's put on governments, local governments, state governments, on nonprofit organizations, lots of groups doing policy research. And I think it's wrong. I think that we're pushing, you know, a lot of the, the important innovation. So, you know, in some ways we've talked about, you know, these labs of democracy, nonprofits can be labs of democracy, states can be labs of democracy. And you can kind of like Pamela was saying, you can work in a community to figure out what's the right solution for your community and really develop an intervention that might be, you know, robust for that community. And this idea of taking, you know, this, this RCT framework and saying, no, we have to have fidelity to this treatment that we've designed in this lab over here by some policy wonks. And we're going to bring this and we're going to make you implement this in your community with fidelity. And you cannot diverge from this, this treatment. Um, that's scary to me. And I think that's where, you know, we end up this, and, and you, you hear that, you know, if you're a true, you know, a social scientist, you want to have true fidelity to that treatment design that you came up with. But that can run against the values of the community that can run against the implementation capacity of the community. And so kind of being able to, um, and that's where I think this kind of this precise framework is really useful in my head, because it's this idea that we need to sometimes soften that <laughs> it's not one or the other, it's it's not an either or, it's it's how do we think about, okay, we do want to be able to test the this intervention, but maybe you're not there yet. Maybe we need to actually give you time to develop and iterate and 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 think about what the right right interventions for your community before we force this RCT framework on you that's going to make you have this, this, you know, fidelity, <laughs> if that makes sense. I think that's an ethical, a huge ethical problem when we do that. And I'd have, let me just jump in there because it's, um, I think Stephanie's been sitting in on most of my research meetings this past six months. <laughs> but, but there is um, an interesting point in, in, in fact, in, in some of the studies that I'm involved in that we're actually sort of asking that the sort of first question, if you do have community involvement um, and it is based upon what the community decides, do you get better outcomes? So um, it's, it's, it's in a way in which you, we're sort of asking that question because again, the evidence for that particular um, approach is pretty weak uh, though you know, people like me or in public health and community engagement are, you know, really, we push this line of uh, the involvement, but we don't have a strong evidence base to um, um, support that that's the right, or the, the way to get the outcomes you want. And so that's part of what we're in fact testing um, in some of these large trials that, um, community engagement trials that I'm involved in is to see what it, uh, what it, what happens in communities and, um, in which communities do outcomes um, uh, improve and, and what can we trace back in those communities. So it's, a, it's in some sense looking at that process within the community, um, but it's asking that question. So uh, it's a different way to come at it. Well, and for policy, the way you're coming at it is exactly right. I mean, I do think that there is evidence that, you know, if I'm looking, thinking of the implementi implementation science research, there's evidence that when you engage the site and the design of the intervention, that it's more likely to stick over time and people are more likely to carry it out over time. So from like a net social welfare benefit, okay, maybe the intervention itself isn't quite as potent because we've allowed the community to adapt it, but it's actually gonna have a longer term effect that's gonna be stronger because they're gonna implement it over time. It's gonna be sustainable. It's not gonna go away as soon as the researchers leave. So I think you know, you're, that's you know, a huge um, important thing to think about. Stay tuned. <laughs> so we have some um, excellent questions from the audience. So I'm going to uh, switch over. Please continue asking your questions. Um, so one one original question was just um, the precise uh, framework and other resources. Would those be made available? And we'll post some of those um, on, at the when we publish the care panel. So look out for that. Um, but so here's an interesting question about consent and the unit of analysis. So it seems like many of the examples discussed assume that the research unit of analysis is household or family. So an individual or parent provides consent, is randomized to a treatment condition. Yet policies related to family dysfunction, we could also think about communities in this way, not only families. Um, so like child maltreatment or intimate partner violence often involve divergent benefits and risks for individual members of the same unit of analysis. How do the issues you've raised relate to public policy studies in these areas? How should we think about that? 
And this is related to the point, Pam, that you were making about how should we think about who the appropriate representative is for when the unit is no longer the individual for providing consent or authorizing um, the research participation. I, I mean, what I would say to that is that um, there's, there's some discussion, I think the jury's out um, in, in how we decide that. I think in some of the um, government related um, policy work, there's some discussion about whether or not there's a gatekeeper um, and whether or not that gatekeeper can speak for whatever that group is. And so you can think about whatever the group size or group is. So if it's a church, let's, let's go that we're gonna randomize churches um, in a community, is, is it uh, enough to get the pastor's consent? Um, is, it, is it enough to get the health commissioner's consent? Is it enough to get the um, county commissioner's consent if what you wanna do is, is randomize when the unit isn't the individual, right? Um, and um, I, again, I think um, there is concern um, on the gatekeeper model because um, you're again um, randomizing or applying an intervention to a group that hasn't had the opportunity to say yes or no to it. I mean, you can think about communication campaigns, you can think about media campaigns around um, COVID um, and, and we're all trying to test which, which messages make the most sense and which will get people to change their behaviors, right? Um, and we do this across communities and, and you know, people are uh, exposed to these things without saying yay or nay to being exposed to them. So, um, but I think we still have to have the conversation as broadly as we can with whatever those entities are. So uh, family units, um, communities, churches, you know, schools, these, this is always the discussion when, it's, when the unit is not the individual. And I just have to say, IRBs have a hard time with this concept. <laughs> At least that's been my experience. I don't know if anybody else. <laughs> Stephanie or Doug, do you want to chime in or should? I mean, I think that, you know, one, one a study that came to my mind was one that we did with the National League of Cities where we were, and I was really impressed with how the National League of Cities handled this. So we were, we were actually working on water utility bills, not in a developing country, but here we were looking at ways to connect uh, people within certain cities uh, to, to resources. So what was the most effective way when somebody's behind on their water bill to get them help? What's the most effective way to get them help? And, and honestly, they didn't know. So they had, you know, a couple of different models. They weren't sure which one was right. But before even thinking about, we, we didn't really randomize at the individual level. We did a couple of different, each city actually, we worked with a different way of, of coming up with an approach. But it was, a, it was a conversation with the stakeholders in that city to figure out what the right approach would be for that city. So we included like the, the, the elected officials, we included, we actually had representatives from customers. Um, and, and National League of Cities, I think, did a really nice job of orchestrating that conversation in a way that because they knew that in order for this to last and in order for this to have legitimacy that the community had to buy in. Um, so that was just an example of something where I was really impressed. It wasn't that they got consent necessarily from the community, it was still individual level interventions, but at least they engaged the community in a discussion about it. So let me ask this um, next question. So that was from Kenneth Steinman and this question is from Sarah Conroy, who's going to bring back the question about sort of clinical research and the history of clinical research. And I mean, in some ways, community buy-in and community mistrust. So, you know, there is a terrible history in the US um, about treating uh, people poorly for the sake of research. And so that might make us wary about, even if it might be in ideal circumstances or without this history, appropriate to not use informed consent for this kind of research maybe given the sort of historic um, experiences that uh, we've had in the United States and in um, other countries re revolved, revolving uh, exploitation in uh, medical research, we need to be more attentive to that. And that sort of historic conversation or, um, makes the requirement of informed consent more prevalent. I don't know what you guys think about that. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I can maybe uh, address it first. I think um, there's a really nice paper uh, that was published a couple of years ago that um, 
just talked about like the various purposes of consent. Uh, and I think it listed like seven, seven of them. And, you know, the, the main purpose of consent is, is just to, you know, respect people's autonomy rights, right? If, if I have authority over what happens to me, uh, researchers need to get my agreement before they proceed in a whole series of ways um, that, would, that would otherwise violate my, my rights. But one of, one of the other uh, uh, um, functions that they, that they uh, really highlighted is, is uh, promoting, promoting trust in their, in their research enterprise, right? And this relates to um, the sort of community engagement stuff as well that both Stephanie and, and, and Pam were, 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 were raising. Uh, which is that maybe maybe you think that uh, with a certain type of research, you know, getting consent might not be strictly speaking absolutely necessary uh, from a from a respect for autonomy perspective, but there's sort of these sort of additional reasons why you would want to sort of go the extra distance um, uh, as as a way of sort of securing buy-in, preserving trust or building trust in the in their research enterprise. And again, I think you know, just thinking about the value that can come from research, it's, it's, it's really important to address those things insofar as oftentimes research is necessary in order to uh, improve the, uh, the well-being of, of, of uh, members of certain communities. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't uh, agree more. I mean, that, that it's, um, especially on these pol many of these policy decisions are um, addressing you know very hard questions that likely um, impact um, marginalized communities or marginalized individuals um, a lot <laughs> um, and maybe more so just as Stephanie's example um, you know I've done a lot of Medicaid work and so uh, you know, it's it's the same when you come to uh, thinking about Medicaid policy and, and how you write uh, sort of Medicaid policy. First policy I ever had to write had to do with whether or not Medicaid would, would cover uh, organ transplants. Um, you know, and so, you know, why do we have a, a, a separate policy about, you know, Medicaid? So that's a different discussion, but it, it is the fact that many of these policy decisions impact um, uh, low-income minority communities um, to a greater extent. And so it, it raises even to a greater level the trust question, I think. Uh, you know, you think about, you know, the, the big trials that we're involved in have around COVID and um, opiate use disorder and, and how we uh, help communities um, move uh, the needle on those outcomes um, is really difficult, and it's a it's a hard conversation to have. So uh, the trust is at the base of all of this. I think. So let me ask um, a question about sort of generalizability and randomized control trials. Can you just give? Um, so I, I think it's really interesting to think about the sort of the sudden push for randomized control trials um, and the way in which they've informed um, policies and uh, non-government, uh, non-governmental organizations in particular, in terms of how they're like thinking about policy implementation. Um, so there's obvious strengths for randomized control trials in terms of showing the sort of the, the specific intervention, the way that it works. So how can we think about translating in a more effective way, the lessons that we learn from research into new settings where it might, there are still these uncertainties related to the generaliz generalizability. So what, for policymakers, what should policymakers be thinking about when they see the research coming in, um, how to implement that research to sort of um, uh, help the well-being of, you know, whatever communities it is that um, they're working with. So I think you, I mean, you have two questions maybe packed in there. And one was about, you know, how do we, how do we take research that's been validated in one context through RCT and take that and lift it somewhere else? Um, and that's actually, I think, a really important, huge question. I mean, there's a classic book that we, we talk about um, in, you know, policy studies, the Pressman and Vodowski book, um, 
that, that talks about this, this policy implementation failure where they tried to take this giant experiment and lift it and place it somewhere else and it, and it didn't work. And, um, there's, and, and I, so I think this is a classic question that we've been struggling with in, in, in policy studies and really the importance of understanding that context and, and not thinking that something that's implemented in one place is gonna necessarily be a success in another place because you've got different political environment, you've got different capacity constraints, you've got different, you know, maybe even different laws and rules that are gonna interact in different ways with, ways with this policy. So I think there should be a lot of caution about taking a policy that was successful in, in Idaho and, and bringing it to California. Like, I think that, that, that sh there should be a pause there for a second <laughs> to really think about that. So that's one question. And I think the other question is about this push for RCTs and there, I mean, I would just say, I think, you know, having more engagement with funders and even government is pushing for these things and a lot of their funding. And I think it depends on what stage you're at in the development of an intervention. Like if we haven't figured out what the right intervention is yet to, to the point, we don't want to do harm. Like we've got to figure out the, 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 the right thing, the, the right kind of interventions by working with the community and thinking about what the right thing is before we, we do an RCT to test something um, so that we're not doing harm to individuals. So to me, that's like a question about like, where are you at in the stage? Are you really to the RCT stage? Um, because I don't think, I think we often rush to that before we're there. So, so I would just jump in and say, um, sort of the, the Deaton paper, it's a great paper, uh, but um, um, even in the best case RCTs, when it's uh, individuals and been very controlled, uh, we know in medicine, even in that kind of setting, um, it often doesn't work in practice um, or doesn't get implemented in practice. It, and um, so then to take it even into a broader um, context, um, we should just be very cautious in thinking that uh, just because it was done in an RCT in one place, um, I mean, it, it doesn't always, it, I mean, as I'm sorry, to say, it, our, our experience at the individual medical level, medical science level is that it often doesn't work. And, and in that sense, we've got a lot more control over when we go out into the policy and, and community realm, so. Yeah, really quickly, because I know we're almost out of time, but uh, there's a, a really great book uh, by Nancy Cartwright. And I think the co-author is Jeremy Hardy. It might just be called something like evidence-based policy, but. Uh, Cartwright's a, you know, originally a philosopher of science and just has a kind of model for thinking about how you would take the results from one RCT in one area and think about whether you would get similar results and outcomes in another area. Uh, and so she really makes use of her, her sort of thinking about causal factors and contributing factors and brings her philosophy of, of science uh, expertise to bear on it. I've always found it really useful. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie, Doug, and Pam. I learned a lot. It opened up a lot of questions. Um, please join us um, for the uh, next month's care panel on the ethics of research with sexual and uh, gender minority populations. Uh, we look forward to that conversation as well and um, have a good month, everyone. Bye-bye.